I have great pleasure in welcoming His Excellency Hassan Ali Kiri, Prime Minister of the Federal Republic of Somalia, and I now invite him to address the General Assembly. Uh, thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General of the United Nations, Honorable Delegates, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. It is an honor to address the 72nd session of the United Nations General Assembly. I bring you warm greetings and good wishes from our President, His Excellency Mohammed Abdullahi Mohammed Farmajo, and the entire government and people of the Republic of Somalia. Allow me to first to congratulate the President of the 72nd session of the United UN's General Assembly for assuming this role and for ably steering the August body toward a successful gathering. This year, this year's session also coincides on a National Peace Day. Yesterday, we observed the International Day of Peace, a day that called for togetherness and solidarity with those who have been forced to flee their homes and those who leave home to seek a better life. The theme of this year's General Assembly speaks of peace and decent life in a sustainable planet. The similarity in focus goes beyond coincidence to acknowledge that the pursuit for peace, decent life, respect, safety, and dignity is a global need, yet elusive for hundreds of millions of people in the world today, from Syria to Central African Republic, from the Rohingya people of Myanmar to the people of Libya. The number of protectorate rate and new conflicts remains unacceptably high. The Somali people have for many years been a victim of war, famine, and poverty which has seen them displaced internally while others made the perilous journey abroad. We therefore know too well the necessity for the others to open their doors to distort and disillusion people who just like us are looking for a safe and dignified living. I take this opportunity to thank all those who even in challenging times, continue to uphold this spirit of oneness, of sharing, and caring. Mr. President, Somalia is rising, and we are determined to stay the course. Our aim is to contribute positively to the progress of our region, our continent, and the world. Despite enormous challenges, we are, among others, improving security, reestablishing law and order, and conducting the necessary political and socio-economic reforms. The progress achieved so far is because the Somali people have embraced a new dawn, and our relentless partners continue to work with us in our journey toward peace and prosperity. We will continue to formulate measures to strengthen Somalia's progress, including in revenue generation. However, there are some serious challenges beyond the control of the Somali government. Debt relief would have the effect of unlocking concessional financing, attracting foreign investment, and providing an opportunity that is critical to sustaining our reform efforts and consequently reinvigorate our economy. We are already working with the international financial institutions towards this objective and through this forum seek your support. Mr. President, terrorism remains one of our pressing challenges. With its repercussions felt globally, as such, our unity in addressing this scourge collectively and sustainably is critical. 
No effort should be spared in utilizing the growth and influence of international terrorists, terrorist organizations such as ISIS, Al-Qaeda, who, as we know, are key influences of localized terrorism. Efforts to step up military interventions against such groups should be redoubled. In Somalia, we've made significant strides, which we have weakened the cap capability of Al-Shabaab. In this regard, I would like to thank AMISOM for their sacrifice and failing support, dedication, and solidarity in the fight against the Shabaab. To ensure the sustainability of such gains, we focused on strengthening the military capability of our national security forces. However, the arms embargo imposed against Somalia is a severe limitation towards this objective. The federal government of Somalia will continue to work with the Security Council and relevant actors on our, on our road, roadmap towards lifting the arms embargo. Poverty and lack of education and livelihood opportunities remain also contributing factors to the growth of violent extremism. Across the world, disillusioned youth are at heightened risk of exploitation by criminal networks, including terrorists. The urgent need to invest in education, skills building, and livelihood opportunities for our youth is crucial. Addressing these key strategic elements to counter terrorism is an enormous task which requires a holistic approach and resources to march. We continue to call upon friends of Somalia to help us in this important undertaking. Mr. President, we cannot talk about sustainable planet without demonstrating commitment to make this wall livable for ourselves and the future generation. Somalia is one of the countries ravaged by a vicious cycle of man-made and natural disasters created directly by environmental degradation. Rains are scarce, leading to crop failure and death of livestock, which subsequently leads to drought and famine. Currently, the humanitarian situation of millions of Somalis remain fragile, as the bite of the current drought, which still threatens to develop into famine, continues. Our national development plan stipulates a clear and realistic roadmap to break in this vicious cycle. However, Somalia and many other countries who are on the receiving end of climate change are unable to find the resources required to tackle this ever-growing problem. In this regard, we urge all member states to continue improving the Paris Climate Agreement, which has the potential to mitigate the effects of climate change. Similarly, developing countries such as ourselves need investment in long-term initiatives, including infrastructure, development, water conservation, innovative food and livestock production, and creation of livelihood opportunities. Mr. President, we need to get a better streamlining global development and aid structures, especially for fragile states. We need to revi revisit the prevailing paradigms and take bold and innovative steps to improve this architecture. The New Deal, engagement in fragile states agreed in South Korea in 2011, was certainly a great step in that direction. Somalia fully embraced this agreement. Yet, with all its strength, the New Deal for Fragile States needs improvement. That said, the mutual accountability principles embedded in the framework are exactly what fragile countries like us need. Oftentimes, 
Bledges are made only to be neglected later. That should not happen as fragile countries rely on such support to rebuild their state. Conversely, development partners are often frustrated with the weak transparency and accountability in institutions that exist in fragile states. Fra that, and that is a legitimate concern, and we as a fragile nation is need to do better by tackling corruption and blocking the leakage. Somalia has recently taken bold steps to address corruption. The anti-corruption bill critical for putting in place measures, measures for good governance and accountability has been approved by my cabinet and tabled for enactment by our, to the parliament. The leadership of my nation has also reiterated it is zero tolerance to corruption. Also relating to this issue and funding generally, we must define predictable funding for non-UN peacekeeping missions this is particularly true for AMISOM in Somalia. For over a decade, they have registered tremendous success, yet they continue to operate in uncertainty of funding each year. We believe that investment in peacekeeping is worthy investment in peace building and state building. And we have seen the positive outcomes of this investment in Somalia. I look forward to engaging our partners on this matter in the coming weeks and months. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a fundamental element of peace building and state building is how any country treats its marginalized and voiceless women are crucial in decision-making and investment in society. In spite of our many challenges, Somalia has made significant steps in this regard. During the 2016 election, the number of women in our parliament increased from 14 to 24 percent. Although we missed our 30 percent target, we did improve markedly from a few years ago. Six months ago, when I was forming my Council of Ministers, I appointed six women to my cabinet. They hold some of the most important portfolios in our nation, including trade and industry, health, ports, youth and sports, women and human rights, and humanitarian affairs. In Somalia, women played an instrumental role during our worst times. In addition to being mothers and wives and sisters, they dominate the informal economy. Money, living as refugees and migrants, remain the lifeline of their families through remittances sent to Somalia. the late Abbas Siraji, who was tragically killed in May this year. He was a beacon of hope for Somalia's young people. Having grown up in the world's largest refugee camp in Kenya, he worked hard, studied, and worked for various UN agencies. I appointed him to the Minister of Public Works and Reconstruction at age 31. And although he is no longer with us, his appointment brought out the potential of thousands of young people across this country, Somalia. He showed them that life in the refugee camps, as harsh as, as it was, didn't mean the end of hope. One of the core principles, Your Excellencies, in these United Nations is the human rights. We are working hard to ensure the respect for the human rights of all people. The establishment of institutions such as the National Human Rights Commission that is mandated to protect and promote human rights will be 
a significant step towards this direction. Vital legislation on human rights, such as the soon-to-be-approved Sexual Offenses Bill, provide the tools to fight impunity of sexual perpetrators. And even though we are fond of our tradition, it should never be a reason to condone impunity. And my government is determined to find ways to harmonize our traditional dispute resolution and our conventional justice system in a manner that respects the human rights of its people. Mr. President, the United Nations continues to, to be the world's most important and common platform for nations to develop and strengthen bilateral and multilateral relations. It is a core UN principle for the states to respect each other's political independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. It is a principle that should be promoted and upheld at all times, especially when engaging with fragile states such as Somalia. Mr. President, in closing, I would like to take this opportunity to add my voice to the reform process of the United Nations. This organization has worked for peace and stability for decades, and I strongly believe that the Secretary General's reform agenda will most certainly lead to a far responsive and dynamic institution. As a country that has greatly benefited from the UN system, we've also seen that it can improve its overall efficiency. With that, I would like to conclude by once again reminding all of us that we must redouble our efforts to focus on peace and decent life for a sustainable planet and that will take a collective recognition that what happens in one corner of the world impacts another corner of the world. Thank you and may Allah bless you all. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of the Federal Republic of Somalia for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency.